uh, recording is started and I'm sharing my screen. All right, so welcome to the uh, operating systems discussion session for theoretical exercise four. And as was requested like half an hour ago on uh, Piazza to give some tips on how to implement the shell, I just uh, quickly uh, built some slides uh, that might give you some tips on how to approach this. So we're not going to the same level of detail as with uh, the previous exercise on, on memory allocation and things, uh, but I think it's it's a good idea to just show you the overall structure for those who, who are not yet familiar with using Unix and Unix shells. All right, let's first start with the theoretical exercise. I think they were not too difficult uh, considering that, that we had examples in the lecture. So this was concerned with all the different main memory man management approaches. So the first one was the body algorithm. So the body algorithm actually has the special property that it always uh, tries to use powers of two from a given base size, like 64 kilobyte in our examples here. So all of the allocations have to be made in a, uh, in, in, in a size that's a power of two multiplied our base size. So in this um, example here, one, two, four, eight times 64 kilobytes. And here we had four examples of allocations. So we had an existing allocation, which was the initial state here in, uh, for at time one. For example, in our example A here, scenario one, we would have a, a 128 kilobyte free block. So you see with body algorithms, uh, all of the free blocks that are adjacent, if they fit into a larger block, which is also a multiple of a power of two. So these two 64 kilobyte blocks can fit into one block that is two times 64 kilobyte. And these four 64 kilobyte blocks back here would fit in a block that's four times to, uh, 64 kilobytes. So these are three blocks here the ones behind and the one in front. And we have two allocated blocks of 64 kilobyte size, which are A and B. And now we have a request, uh, a request for releasing something. So that's the R here. And we want to release B. So release is a free operation. So uh, essentially what happens is that first, of course, the memory reserved for B is freed. And after that, the body algorithm actually checks can we combine the areas which are free now in our memory to a larger area, which is again a power of two. Now here we had 256 kilobytes plus 64. Well, that's not a power of two. So that's all we can do here. Let's look at our next scenario, scenario two. We have an initial free memory. So it's the whole large block, 512 kilobytes. And now we allocate something for memory area X, which has 128, uh, 21 kilobytes in size. So this means we need to find a block, which is a power of two, which is at least as large as our allocation. And obviously if we want to allocate 121 kilobytes, we need to find a 128 kilobyte block. So uh, we could split our allocation here into smaller blocks, which always have to have the power of two of size. So we uh, could split the, uh, it first in halves. So the second half is 256 kilobytes free. And then we split the first half again. So we have a free block of 128 kilobytes on the second half here. And then we allocate X to our first half. So to our first 64 kilobyte blocks, the first two here, which are 128 kilobytes. And so we can allocate X to this. And it works similar for the other examples. So here we have a, a free operation, a release again. So we had an initial allocation of 128 kilobytes free, 64 kilobytes free. Then we had 64 kilobytes of Y and uh, we had uh, 256 kilobytes of A. So A remains allocated after our release. So it stays in the remaining 256 kilobytes. Y is released and then we can figure out, okay, there's adjacent free blocks. So we could combine this free block where Y was located with the uh, next free block to the left here. So this would be 128 kilobytes. And then we figure out there's two 128 kilobyte blocks close to each other. So we could combine this into a large 256 kilobyte block. And finally, scenario four. Here we have an initial configuration. 
uh, where we have 64 and 128 kilobytes free. And where are we here? And back here, we have again 64 kilobytes and 128 kilobytes free. But the 180 kilobyte allocation would require a free block of at least 256 kilobytes because it has to fit in, into such a larger block of uh, a power of two. So the first two blocks won't make it. And the second two also won't make it because that would create an allocated part with pro, a, a size that's not a power of two. And so that would be problematic here with a body algorithm. All right. Next question was about first fit. I think that was an easy one. So just finding places to fit in. And we already gave two examples for this. So we had an initial configuration here. So each of these blocks is a one megabyte block here. So we had an allocation of A of three megabytes, of B of three megabytes, six max of C, uh, one, two, three, four, five max of D and four max of E with some gaps. So the empty squares here in between. So first we release A. So this just releases the first three blocks here. Then we uh, whoops, allocate four megabytes for F. And well, in this situation on the second line here, we would need the first fit. So F needs four blocks. It doesn't fit in the first gap. It doesn't fit in the second gap. So it has to fit in this third gap here, which is the six wide. So we use four of these six blocks for allocating F. So that was already given. Then we allocate two megabytes for A again. So we find the first free block, which was the one we released in the beginning. So we can place A here. The rest stays unchanged. Then we can release B. So these three blocks of B are deallocated here. So we have a larger gap now. Then we can release E. So we have another larger gap back here again. Then we allocate seven megabytes for E. So we have to find a block that's large enough for uh, storing seven megabytes of E. The first one here is six. It doesn't fit. The second one is only two. That doesn't fit. And the last one, luckily, is exactly seven. So we put E back here. Then we release E again. So we just free these seven blocks again. And now we allocate another E with only four megabytes. And so now it's no longer located back here because now it fits in our first gap, which is six megabytes wide. So we can fit our four max of E here. Well, I think that was rather obvious, right? But still, it's a good idea to have seen this once. And the third theoretical exercise question was on page replacement. So just using the FIFO algorithm to replace pages. And FIFO means first in, first out. So what's done internally is we keep a, a record of the age of a page down here. So whenever a page is uh, swapped in or paged in from external storage, then we reset its age to zero. And then we increase the age of each page with uh, each time step here. And so whenever a page needs to be replaced because our memory is full, then we replace the page that was uh, brought into memory first. So the page that actually has the highest age. So uh, we already gave the first four examples here. So the next allocation is page number five. So what we do here is we look at our current ages in, in page, at time four. And we see page frame one obviously was the one we brought in first. It has the highest age. So we're going to replace this one here. So page frame one is replaced by page uh, by, uh, by the contents of page five. And uh, the time is reset to zero and the others just are increased. Then we have a request for uh, paging in page number six. We need to find another page frame here. So it's always important to differentiate between pages, which are the logical construct and page frames, which are the sections or, or parts of the physical memory where you copy it to, right? So now we need to find our next oldest, which is now page frame two, which has an age of three now because we just reset the uh, age of page frame one to zero. So we replace page frame two and store page number six into it. Rest stays unchanged and times are increased, except for that one here, which we reset because we just loaded our new page frame and in, uh, page into it. Then we have a request for page number one, 
So page number one is also not in memory at the moment. So we need to find the oldest again, that works as before. So uh, we replace page frame three, the contents of page frame three with the contents of page one. And when we have our next request for uh, page number two again, then uh, the oldest one is page frame four. So we replace that contents with page two and again, set the time to zero. And when we have another request for page three, the oldest is now again page frame one because we loaded it at time point five. So we reset this and load page uh, three into page frame one. And the only exception to this, so this gets boring pretty fast, is now when we uh, again request uh, page two, because this is already in memory here, because we just loaded it into page frame four two time steps ago. And this means we don't need to replace anything. And the only thing we do, whoops, is, and sorry, that's that's a typo here. Uh, yes, that was not what I wanted. Uh, just a second. Nah. I'm sorry. That's what I wanted. Sorry, uh, so there's a bug on the slide I've just seen. Of course, we need to reset the age of that page frame here. So it's no longer two, it must be reset to zero. So down here, the number in the uh, lower right corner needs to be replaced by zero. I'll fix the slides before I upload them. Sorry for that. Okay, so the uh, next interesting thing for you was probably how to work with the Unix shell or how to build your Unix shell. So I thought building a Unix shell would be a nice exercise to actually uh, bring together some of the stuff you've been working with. So allocating memory on the heap, for example, a bit of uh, yeah, advanced C coding, and of course, using fork and exec. And that's a typical task you have to do. And that's a special feature of Unix that you're actually able to replace the shell. Because in many operating systems, this is just built and fixed and cannot be replaced. So what does a Unix shell look like? Uh, the general structure here is first, of course, your Unix shell should initialize whatever variables it needs. And then we have something we call, well, usually you call, you, you probably should know it as a REPL, so a read, evaluate, print loop. So first it reads something from the terminal, from your keyboard, then it evaluates it, then it prints a result probably, and then it starts again because it's a loop. So that's exactly what we're doing. So first we print a prompt, then we read a command line. Then we scan and parse it. That's the easy parts. And after we scanned and parsed this command line, uh, we should get a number of outputs. So we should have split our command line into the semantic parts we're interested in. And what are the parts of a Unix command? Let's, let's go to the next slide to explain this and I'll return to this one here. Sorry, this was set up a bit on last minute due to this request. Uh, so, uh, Unix command lines look like this. So first your shell prints the prompt, which is displayed in blue here. Then the first thing that's given on the command line and uh, parameters or things on the command line are, are separated usually by white space, so by space characters or tab characters or something. So the first one is always your command name. It could be bin ls or bin set or whatever. Uh, then you have an optional number of parameters. These are also separated by white space. So when you have bin ls, then your first parameter would be dash l here. Your second would be slash bin. Your third would be slash user slash bin. Or for your set command on the second line here, it would be uh, s slash foo slash bar, which is a command for the set stream editor. And then optionally, you have some, so, so parameters are optional because you know you can simply type ls without anything else. And it would just, assume you want the current directory to be listed, that works. And then optionally, you can redirect the input and output. So you can redirect the input of a command from a file on your file system using the uh, left uh, angle bracket here. So the less than symbol. And you can out, uh, redirect the output using the uh, greater sign here to another file in your file system. And this is of course the basis to build pipelines. 
because if you remember your lecture on, on pipelines and process communication, that's exactly how you do it. You do a redirect of the input and output of a, a task. So in this task, you're not asked to build pipelines, which would be nice, but maybe going a bit too far. If you want, of course, you can do it. Uh, but uh, we just uh, are content with redirecting input and output. And of course, redirecting input and output is also completely optional. Uh, because if you don't redirect input and output, well, uh, it just reads input from standard in, so from your keyboard usually, and writes to standard out, so to your screen. So let's go back to our structure here. So uh, we have our command, which is the first thing on your command line. Then we have optionally one too many arguments, which are maybe stored as an array of character pointers. And then we optionally have a file name for the input redirect and another file name optionally for the output redirect. And I've just given them name here, names here to refer. So the command might be in a, in, a, in a variable called command. The arguments might be in an array here, arcs. And then we have in f and out f maybe. So what should you do when you build a shell? Now you have parsed it. So now you can check what to do. So we've given the uh, hint that you need to implement some internal commands and please think about why these have to be internal and not and cannot be called as an external command uh, as usual. So cd change directory must be an internal command and I'm not telling you why here because that's one of the things you should think about. If you figure out that the command here was cd then you should use the uh, Unix system call to change your directory and after you did this well you can start again printing a prompt read the next command line. If it was exit, then you want to terminate your shell, then you just call exit and that's it, right? Because then your program is terminated. So if it was not CD or exit, your shell assumes that you want to call an external command like bin ls or bin set or whatever. The shell doesn't check if this command exists. That's important. The shell just assumes that the user knows what he or she is doing and it starts whatever command is given. And if this command is not, it does not exist, well, your operating system will complain. So what you do as a shell, because you want to continue executing your shell afterwards, we need to fork. So we need to create a child process here. So as usual in a fork exercise, our parent process waits for its child, so not to create zombies. So this means our shell only prints our next prompt when this child has terminated either regularly or crashed. And in the child process, you first check if there's an input redirect. If yes, then you have to redirect the input and we have a separate slide on this. If not, we check for an output redirect in any case, because we have an output and an input redirect. And then we redirect the output. And then after we redirected input or output or not at all, then we use an exec call to actually start the command that was passed in our command parameter here with the arguments that was given uh, that were given in R. And if this command doesn't exist, for example, because you, you made a typo or if you don't have execute permission on that command, that is one of the rare cases where exec returns. So exec tells you, ah, well, there's a problem executing that program because uh, it doesn't exist. And you need to catch this error of course, because you should tell the user that there was, was an error on the input line. And nevertheless, if it returns with an error, so it couldn't execute the program, you just start printing a prompt again after printing an error message. Or if your program uh, completed successfully, so your exec doesn't return, this means this error here actually doesn't exist, right? It's just, just drawn, to, maybe I should have dotted it, it's just drawn for convenience. This means your child process has terminated but your parent process, your shell has returned, its wait pit returns, it's successful. And so it can start printing a prompt again. And then you can enter the next command as before. Okay, so we've seen how to do the parsing. So now I'm giving you some quick tips uh, on implementation details, which should help you. First, how to do the parsing and scanning. Doing this by hand, I did this. I sent this out to the TAs and the TAs complained, your code is full of bugs in memory overflows and allocations. Well, I wrote this code at like two o'clock at night. So uh, yes, <laughs> I, I made an update uh, and you, sh you can try to parse it by hand, but it's not a nice exercise. This It's so easy to make mistakes. If you're by coincidence on the compilers course, you could use Lex for this. Lex is a nice tool. 
but there's it's a bit of a too simple task for Lex actually. So the alternative is either using one of the str top libc functions. So str top stands for tokenized strings. So in compiler theory, a token is just a part of the input sequence that has some semantic meaning, like a command or a parameter or an output redirect. And there's, for example, a, a function called str talk r, uh, which has this uh, signature here. So it takes a string to tokenize. It takes uh, the characters uh, that should serve as separators here. So this is a string because it can have more than one character as a separator and goes through all of them. And then finally, it needs to keep some state because like Lex, it implements a state machine because you want to have each token separately returned. So this function str talk has to remember where it was the last time when it went through the string. And it remembers this in a pointer to a pointer uh, that's called last s, last string. And this is a pointer to a pointer because what it needs to remember is a position in a string, so a character pointer. And since it needs to write to this variable here, because that's the variable you provide, it needs the address of this variable. So it writes a character pointer into your variable here. That's why it's a pointer pointer. And that's a bit confusing. And so here's an example uh, shamelessly copied from the main page on Mac OS 10. So we define a line of 80 characters. We define some separation characters, which would be a backslash. You need to write it as two backslashes because the backslash has a special meaning of escaping characters in format strings. A slash, colon, semicolon, equals, and minus sign. And then you have some character pointers here. And then we uh, just copy uh, a string uh, to our test string here. And you see there's a lot of separators in here. And if you use this loop here, so you start, your first parameter is returned, word equals str talk r, and then you pass the string you want to tokenize first, the string of separator second, and this address of the character pointer where this position in your string, for example, here where to continue, like at the is, at the second invocation, there it is stored automatically. And then for the next uh, iteration of your loop, you just call this again, with uh, passing to str talk where you left off the same separators, but now you pass null because str talk took an internal copy of your string. So by giving it null, it means please continue working with uh, the pointer we've just passed here. And then you can print in a print loop. You can test this code, of course, which uh, so it should print all of the tokens. So all of these separated partial strings here, one after the other. Now there's an alternative, uh, which I have never used, I must admit, because I'm using Unix for 30 years. So some of that stuff I'm teaching you might be a bit antiquated, uh, but I'm, I'm <laughs> you know, updating my own knowledge here. So uh, as I read the STR talk man page, I haven't read this for a couple of years, I must admit. And there was, okay, this function uh, could can be replaced by STR sep. So STR sep seems to be a new function, making this a bit more easy. And uh, so this is an example or two examples from the man page. So the first one does exactly uh, the same uh, as our previous example. So it just tokenizes the string and prints each token separately. This is a bit easier to call because you don't need to pass this pointer uh, to the str talk function, which remembers the location. And the second example might be very useful uh, for passing argument strings because that's from the main page. That's exactly what it does. So we have a separation string, which is either a space or a tab character. So our white space here. So we do a separation here and then uh, it's separated into this argument value array automatically. But here you have these pointers to pointers again. So I, I won't go into details here, but uh, try to understand how this is working. And if you understood it well, then it's easy to use, then it would be very convenient. All right, what else uh, was there? IO redirection. So redirection of IO in Unix is uh, well based on, on this principle that everything's a file, including your standard input and output. So when you want to redirect something to an existing file descriptor, you need to change the assignment of that file descriptor to another file descriptor that you have obtained. And to do this, there are two system calls in Unix. The first one is called dub, and the second one is called dub2. And the second one is called dub2 because it takes two file descriptors. And these are ancient. So these have existed in Unix for almost 50 years. And what you do is 
Usually you want to redirect, for example, standard input, standard output. These have standard file descriptors in Unix. So standard input is always zero, standard output is always one. So these are automatically attached to your keyboard as standard input and to your screen as standard output. When your program is started, unless you have input output redirection or a pipeline in your shell. So if you just start a program as usual with an exec, then you need to redirect this standard input or output if there was a standard input or output redirection on the command line given. And you do this by first closing the file descriptor that, was, uh, that you want to redirect. So as a standard in zero or standard out one. And then the stop call, the first one here, just looks for the first free file descriptor. And since zero and one are obviously the first two, then if you close zero, then dup finds, okay, zero is free and it was passed a file descriptor now, a new one of a file you opened for the redirection. So it copies this file descriptor you passed, the, the information of this redirection into the file descriptor zero, for example, if you do an input redirection. And this means from now on, everything that's output on zero, uh, input from zero, so using uh, get char or uh, scanf or something like that, is read from that file you just redirected. And the same for output, of course. So if you close one and then do a dub, then uh, all of the regular output is redirected. So all put s or print f. Uh, and, and, and all that stuff. So that's very convenient and that's exactly what you want. Now Unix made this a bit more convenient later on by introducing this dub2 call. So here you don't need to do this closing semantics because this closing semantics is critical when you have a multi-threaded program. Because if another program actually uh, closes another file descriptor which is lower than the one you've closed between close and dub, <laughs> then your system would get very confused and would, uh, uh, would actually reallocate the wrong file descriptor. For our example, it doesn't really matter because we're not writing a multi-thread program, but generally to redirect IO, you open the file you want to redirect to or from. So you call open with the file name that was passed on the command line. So either you call it with O read only, for example, as a parameter or O write only. Uh, take care that for an output redirection, you might have to create that file, so check the O create option here. And then you get a file descriptor for that file back. We call it refd, uh, for example, here. So redirection file descriptor. And then if you want to use dub, then you close standard in or standard out and call dub with this refd file descriptor you just obtained as parameter here. So that would be the first option. Or you call dub2 with the file descriptor you want to redirect and the file is uh, so zero or one here as the first one and the second one, the one you just obtained in this open call. So that's Unix shell IO redirection. And uh, essentially pipelines work the same way. So if you want to implement a pipeline, which you don't have to, you need to redirect the output of one file to the input of the next file. And to do this, uh, take a look at the interprocess communication lecture because we've described the ways to do it there. And finally, of course, you need to execute your command. And we've seen there's a large number of exec calls. So depending on how you represent your, uh, uh, your parameters here, uh, there's uh, exec calls like uh, from the exec L family where you give each parameter separately. That might be inconvenient for you if you store your character pointers in an array. So there's also the exec V function family uh, where you can just pass a pointer to an array, so a pointer to a character pointer for the arguments. Uh, the first parameter is always the program to execute, obviously. And uh, essentially, uh, when you don't want to pass any parameters, you can pass null here. You need to take care of one thing when passing parameters on Unix to exec. The zeros parameters, so the very first entry in your per, uh, argument array is just the program name repeated. So the program can figure out with which name it was executed. So if you have a program bin ls uh, and then an option dash l, then your argument vector here, your argument array would have bin ls as the zeros entry and dash l as the first one. If you forgot this, 
your program will get confused because it assumes that all the parameters has to parse start at index one and not zero. And I encourage you to read the main page, try to figure out, because I don't know your string implementation, how you handle the, the internal representation. That's of course up to you. Uh, so try to figure out uh, which exec function might cause the least amount of headaches for you, I'd say. So some of these might be more appropriate than others. All right, so I hope this was at least a bit helpful for you to figure out how Unix shells are supposed to work. Obviously, I'm not giving more code examples, but I wrote the Unix shell myself like uh, in a late night session. It's about 120 lines of code, including comments and, and empty lines and stuff. So I think that should be very feasible. And uh, yeah, giving, giving this, uh, well, uh, diagram of, of how a shell is supposed to operate, I think it should be possible for you to, to build a shell now that works in this minimal way as, the, uh, as we prescribe in our woefully incomplete Unix shell, the wish shell. All right, I'll stop recording now. Uh, are there any, where is my stop recording button? Let's stop sharing button and there's my stop.